I'm Lanon Tarasenko. Um, I'm currently the head of the engineering science department, which is the third biggest department in the university. Uh, but my passion really is to develop medtech products for patient benefit. You've already heard about SEND. You've already heard about gestational diabetes, GDM Health. You've already heard about Edge COPD. They're all developed in my group. Um, and what's interesting about the group, I think, is that in blue, you've got the engineers, and in green, you've got the docs. So actually, we have a seamless integration of doctors and engineers, and that's what I believe uh, the success of our group is we co-design from day one. We don't think about what might be a good thing for patients or for clinicians to use. We work from day one with the clinicians, the guys in greens. And indeed, you'll hear from Dario Salvi, uh, who's one of our engineers, and Tim Bonici. In fact, we have quite an influence on the session. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, gestational diabetes, SEND, and edge COPD, but I've been given a completely different title. So I'm going to talk about something different. Um, from consumer devices to healthcare products, that's the title I've been given. I'm happy to take questions about the three products that I mentioned. But um, I, th I was given this title because obviously the session is about wearables. Are wearables really something worth investing in? Are they here to stay? Do they really uh, help uh, deliver healthcare? Or are they just gimmick consumer devices uh, that you get at Christmas and you're no longer using six months later. So here they are. I mean, I've tried to incorporate as many manufacturers as possible on this slide, so not uh, to upset anybody. Some of them actually, since I made the slide, are, are no longer on the market. I believe you can't buy the Microsoft Band anymore. I, I could be wrong. But there's plenty of choice. And some of you may have had some of these for, for Christmas, as I said. Uh, it's mostly tracking your activity, your steps, um, and your heart rate occasionally. But the key thing, these are not healthcare devices. They're not C marked for healthcare use or indeed FDA approved. They're there to monitor the well-being of people like you. So I expect, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but I expect there's at least 50% of people here who are wearing one of those at the moment. But I would argue they are consumer devices, not healthcare products. Our focus is not on wellness in that sense, you know, I was monitoring the wellness of people who already are well, but is to improve the self-management of chronic disease. Now, Keith Shannon and one or two other speakers already mentioned chronic disease. Um, it's a big deal, as I'm sure all of you know. If you look at how much money we're spending in healthcare in 1967 and how much we're spending in 2017, there's been a huge growth. 80% of that growth um, in the developed world comes from spending on um, chronic diseases, for example, diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is mostly a smoker's disease, but not uniquely. It can be what asthma turns into in later life. The statistics are staggering. Um, 130 million people in the US, 1.4 trillion a year. That's why there had to be Obamacare. Um, we wait to see what will follow Obamacare if it's dismantled. In the UK, about 17 and a half, 18 million people now, a third of the population. So this is not a niche problem, but the key fact perhaps, um, if we are gonna tackle chronic disease, is that two thirds of them are age 75 or above. So you heard about SEND, and Tim Bonici would talk about SEND. The average hospital patient is one of these people. You've heard about, um, I'm gonna mention briefly, edge COPD. Um, in our last clinical trial, the average age was 70. Gestational diabetes is slightly different because it affects pregnant women, but as that is, uh, apart from gestational diabetes, the sort of patient population we're dealing with. And that does have some implications in the way you design the digital health. Um, so <clears throat> we're engineers, we think in terms of systems, and this is the loop um, in control engineering that we are considering. You have uh, the patient, of course, at the center, um, and then there are some devices that can be attached or given to the patient. I'll come back to that. That's, that's actually quite a subtle but an important point. We will monitor some aspects of that patient's physiology by doing what we call vital sign monitoring. I'll say more about that on the next slide. Um, if we do robust data collection, and it's very important that it is robust and reliable, we build large-scale data sets. And um, the, uh, the paradox is in order to have um, personalized healthcare, you need to have very large data sets. Um, so 
if I had more time, I would explain uh, what that is. But um, <clears throat> to personalize the risk score, you have to do machine learning on the data sets that includes 10,000 or more patients. And then if we can close the loop after the data analytics, we are able to deliver back to the patient or alert their clinician if the patient's coming out of control, some personalized self-management advice. So that effectively is the loop. Um, in intensive care, that loop goes all the way around in a matter of minutes, sometimes a matter of seconds. Um, in wellness and so on, it can be a matter of decades. Most of the problems we deal with in chronic disease, the time constant that loop is probably a matter of hours to days maximum. So what are the vital signs we monitor? Well, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but we might monitor blood pressure. Uh, we're worried about blood pressure rising, which puts people at increased risk of a stroke. Temperature, heart rate, breathing rate, oxygen saturation uh, to monitor lung function because a decrease in your SATs, as they're called, can often be a precursor to an exacerbation of the COPD condition and uh, mean that the patient ends up in hospital. And then weight can indicate uh, a buildup of fluid uh, in heart failure patients. And of course, people with diabetes measure their blood glucose on a regular basis if they've got type 1 or gestational diabetes. Now, one important fact in all the digital health apps that we have developed is the patient diary, sometimes known as a symptom diary. And that's very important, track the progress of some of the diseases. So it's not just data you're collecting from the patient, but also you're asking them to answer some simple questions about the progression of their symptoms. That is quite important because that means the person becomes actively involved in the self-monitoring. And one of the key factors about wearables for um, monitoring condition is that you, you are in danger of turning the patient into a passive recipient of monitoring. And in terms of behavioral psychology, that has a huge impact. If you are passively monitored, you will not react as if you're actively monitoring and learning about your condition. And we discussed this in one of our uh, articles or letters to JAMA, uh, Professor Andrew Farmer and I, if you want to look up the reference. So, edge COPD, I'll mention very briefly, I've got two slides. Remember, we're talking about patients uh, on average 70 or above. So, the first thing you discover, not only co-designing with clinicians, but co-designing with patients, is that they don't like these because they can't actually use the keyboard. And that's actually true also with a tablet, because most of them have got mild tremors, um, uh, and, and therefore it's very hard for them to hit the key. And after about 24, 48 hours, they get fed up. So, instead, we have very large icons uh, that we use uh, maximum of four here, maximum of five, uh, so it makes it easier for them to access uh, the information. I could give a whole talk on how it ha you have to make the data collection, the data acquisition reliable. Um, that's, a, that's a talk about signal processing and machine learning. Uh, that's just a second bullet point. And then of course, once they get the uh, data back, you have to help them to interpret the data if you are going to get them into the stage of self-management beyond self-monitoring. Um, and then, of course, everybody's COPD is different. Everybody's heart failure is different. If you're going to alert reliably, you have to use machine learning to learn the characteristics of that patient so that you have personalized alerting. And so uh, if we developed uh, technology this way, we found high levels of adherence, greater than 85% in the 12 months. Um, randomized controlled trial. We wrote up um, the patient's feeling about the technology in a paper the British Journal of Practice, you can see there. But anyway, because we designed it with patients, there was overwhelming acceptance of the technology. In the randomized controlled trial itself, the results of which were published in uh, the journal Medical Internet Research earlier on this year, uh, we found that actually by enabling patients to self-manage better, they were turning up more rarely at their GP practice. So four annual contacts versus 5.5 with the GP, that's a 28% decrease and a 40% decrease in the number of contacts with the practice nurses. As well, and those do have the p-value, so statistically significant practice nurses on the borderline in terms of contacts with GPs. 20% reduction in hospital admissions, but that's not statistically significant because we didn't have a large enough sample size to reach statistical significance. So it can be done. You can actually use these um, technologies to have an impact on the management uh, of, of chronic disease through enabling patients to self-manage. So where do we go next for my last five minutes? Um, 
So I've, what you saw in the last two slides were patients that put sensors on their fingers to measure their oxygen saturation, their heart rate. They're actively monitoring for short periods each day, once a day or twice a day. I've mentioned that um, the technology that we will look at next might be something where the patient is passively monitored to get continuous monitoring. So you have various companies developing digital plasters. Um, there's uh, iSensis not far from here, Proteus in Silicon Valley, that does give you continuous monitoring, but limited battery life, and that is an issue. Patients in their 70s might not realize the batteries run out, might find it um, uh, difficult to change the battery on a regular basis. You have to be close to one of these at all times. Um, you only get out of these patches at the moment one vital sign, usually the heart rate, and there's possible damage to fragile skin. However, it is true that even the big players are trying to uh, think about this market. Uh, I've just picked Philips because Philips are making a play of developing a health watch to give this continuous monitoring and they are trying to get it FDA approved. So it's different from other watches like the Apple Watch and so on, which are still consumer devices. Philips here, as a healthcare company, is trying to use that technology and move it into the healthcare space. So they offer continuous monitoring through the watch, but again, it's got limited battery life. Uh, you have to be able to use the app that comes with it, so you have to have your phone nearby. And again, it only provides one vital sign, the heart rate. And they can't quite give up making it a health and well-being device because you still have the GPS, step counter, and some form of sleep tracking, which is what most of you would use these devices for. Just to plug another um, one of the things that we do in the lab, which is to say, actually, wearables um, may not be the only solution. You may have come across this technology that we're developing with our Spinite, OxyHealth, whereby, and this is one of the patients in the um, uh, renal unit here in Oxford, who has uh, his uh, breathing rate monitored by a chest band, blood pressure cuff, uh, the pulse oximeter that measures the oxygen saturation and the heart rate. And effectively, while taking all of this, we've shown that the heart rate, breathing rate, and changes in oxygen saturation can be monitored with a, with a webcam here about one and a half meters away. So thinking ten, five, ten years away, actually, it might not just be all wearables. You'll hear about an alternative technique, I'm sure, in the next talk, which is a slightly different form of wearables, but long term, it might be non-wearables that allows us uh, to develop these technologies. And especially if you talk about patients in their 75s and so on, this technology can be installed in rooms in hospital, but also in care homes uh, to monitor people without having to attach anything to them. So just to finish, um, this is our current grant. Um, after the development of these products I've mentioned, we're now looking at the next phase, and we've tried to learn what is missing from wearables, really to turn them truly from consumer products to healthcare devices. Now, the first thing to note, it's not worth developing a, a wearable patch or giving people a health watch if you're only going to measure one parameter. I mean, just a heart rate is never going to make it useful. So we're looking at increasing the number of parameters. Um, you can derive the bring rate through some clever signal processing algorithm, either looking at the heart rate variability or the way that the um, uh, pulse amplitude from the light that goes through your finger varies over time. It is modulated by the breathing. Uh, if you have two light-emitting diodes in your optical probe, you might be able to derive oxygen saturation or at least changes in oxygen saturation. And then we can't quite measure blood pressure directly, but looking at the time that the pulse takes to go from one side to another, you may have a surrogate uh, of blood pressure. But that is definitely something that's going to have to come along if we can turn the devices into healthcare devices. Heart rate just isn't enough. And of course, we have to be smart. The battery life issue is still probably the biggest issue, never mind the number of parameters. Um, we try these devices in hospital in a controlled environment before we move them to home. If you work with the NHS and you do a trial of these devices, you have to make sure the battery lasts from Friday at 5 o'clock to Monday at 9 o'clock. So you have to have 72 hours of use. These are the facts of life of working in the NHS. And so you cannot expect patients or healthcare assistants or, or locums to replace the batteries over the weekend. So we have to be clever because with most of these technologies, the battery tends to run out, especially if you want to measure multiple parameters. So can we make the sensors smart and learn using some form of machine learning when we actually need to monitor? If a patient is stable, you only need to send a new 
parameter every five minutes. If they uh, begin to get worse, you need to increase the frequency of monitoring, but of course you need to build that intelligence on the sensor, and this is the, one of the things that we're doing in this particular grant. Um, so, um, just to finish off, um, the loop that I showed here, we wearables included now, so in the right hand, um, so I should warn everybody here, if you press too hard on this, it seems to have a problem. Um, <laughs> So if I could have the last slide back from um, whoever is, that's it. Thank you very much. No, the last one. Uh, if we could move to the last slide. What I was going to show you is um, uh, the loop that I was showing you with the second block. Why does it refuse? <coughs> I don't quite know why it refuses to show this slide. I'm trying to break the 13 minutes. Um, in that box, wearable devices that I've been mentioning, uh, we still have the data analytics and the feedback, but the talk was about wearable devices. Heart rate, breathing rate, oxygen saturation, blood pressure I've mentioned. That's where we're going next. We have to develop the technology to do this as part of wearables. But the point that I made earlier to finish, um, you are now passively monitoring the patient. You are changing the baby. Instead of them putting the probe on once or twice a day, you are passively monitoring them in their homes, out of hospital, and then you have to bring in the behavioral psychologist to make sure that we generate the right response, for example, responding to an alert, um, and that response goes to the right individual, sometimes it might be to the patient, sometimes to the remote clinician at the right time. So moving wearables from consumer products to healthcare devices is an interesting journey, but it, it raises a lot of issues, and I've just presented a couple of them today. Thank you very much indeed.